Lord willing, we'll get through the entire chapter tonight. I could take the next seven weeks and just go through the seven churches of Asia Minor. Truth is, I want to get to chapter four quicker than that. So uh, we're going to take the four churches that are found in chapter two tonight. Then, Lord willing, the next week we'll take the three churches found in chapter three. And so that means in three weeks. How does that work out with the revival? Uh, let's see. Uh, we'll start before the revival, so that's good. Praise the Lord. All right, let's begin by just reading the first seven verses. Unto the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now in the name of the Lord Jesus, and may we open our ears and our hearts to your word tonight that we may learn some things, not only about truth concerning the local church, but Father, just about our own lives and our walk with you and what you find acceptable and what pleases you. Now, Lord, have your way in every heart and every life, and we'll thank you for it, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. All right, all right let's review the things that we think we've learned thus far. The author of the book of the Revelation is who? John. Very good. Written about what year? A.D. And written from where? Patmos. And written to who? The seven churches. All right. Now, that was fair, but I think we can do better than that, so let's start all over again. The author of the book of Revelation is who? John. Written about what year? A.D. And written from where? And written to who? The seven churches. And the theme of the book is what? The second coming. And the key verse is found in chapter 1 and verse what? 19. Let's all find it. We're going to read it together. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. That's the key verse because it gives us the outline of the book. The things which thou hast seen are found in chapter what? 1. Very good. And the things which are found in chapters what? Two. And, and the things which shall be hereafter begin in chapter what? Four. Four. And they go on through the remainder of the book. All right, we haven't done it like that before. Let's try it again. The things which thou hast seen are found in chapter what? One. The things which are found in chapters And the things which shall be hereafter begin in chapter what? Four. And they go on through the remainder of the book. Now, you remember this book was written to clarify, not to mystify when it comes to the second coming of Christ. This is to clarify truth, not to keep you in the dark. If he wanted to keep you in the dark, he would have simply said nothing. Also understand that this book was not primarily written to the theologians. It's written to the local church. It's written to the people of the local church. Matter of fact, the things that are written, for instance, in these uh, seven letters to the churches, those people were expected to understand exactly what he was talking about. And that meant they might have been able to compare some things, yes, with the Old Testament uh, and even some of the New Testament books, but most likely they had not even seen all the New Testament books that had been written yet. But they were expected to understand it. This book is for you. And so you read it with the understanding that he wrote these things, not just for us to be grounded, but that we also walk in obedience to his word. Now we get to this part of the scripture that deals with the things which are the letters to the seven churches. Uh, there are many who will tell you there's a threefold purpose. I per personally see two, but there are many who will tell you there's a threefold purpose. There is a past purpose, and that is that these were seven actual historical churches, and he's writing either to correct things or commend them for things in those actual churches with those people right there in the local churches. And then there is the present purpose, and that is that these same problems are, have been in churches in every part of the church age, in different churches. And you notice that no one of these churches had the same problems because every church is different. 
And in church life, a church may go through the stages of all seven of these churches at one point or another. Matter of fact, you can see a number of things like that, but it is that present purpose. In other words, these things written to those churches are just as good for us at Madison Baptist Church today. And then some see a future or a prophetic purpose, and that prophetic purpose is they see each church representing a different time in the church age, with, of course, the first century church being the church at Ephesus. And then the, uh, from 100 A.D. on through 314 A.D. is the church at Smyrna, the persecuted church. And then you got the state church, of course, with the uh, Rome taking over the, the political organization, taking over the church, chapter 3, and, and then on through like that. Now, I have trouble with that for a number of reasons, but there are a lot of very, very good men who see that in there. I wouldn't fall out with them. They're still good men. Uh, and maybe one day God will open up my eyes so I can see that too. But right now, I don't see it because it does make the Roman church then part of his church, and it makes the Protestant church the part of his church, and it makes Philadelphia and Laodicea, unlike all the other churches, having to run at exactly the same time, and that's totally inconsistent with the rest of the whole view. Now, that's my own personal thought. Again, if you feel this prophetic, that's fine. I won't fall out with you on it. Now, there are some commonalities in these seven letters. There are six things that each of these letters have in common. One, there is a commission to the angel of the church or the messenger of the church. Number two, it describes a different part of the character of Jesus depending on what his message is going to be to that particular church. Number three, he gives a critique of the church. He says, he says to each one of these churches, I know thy works. To five of those churches, or six of those churches, he mentions some good things. And to five of those churches, he mentions some bad things. See, one of those churches he didn't say any good thing about. That's the church at Laodicea. But the other churches, he all says something good about them. But there are two churches that he says nothing bad about whatsoever. And then, of course, he gives counsel to each of the churches, some things that they should do. And then he promises a confirmation to the overcomers, some promises to the overcomers, which are special. And, of course, the overcomers are defined for us in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. They are people who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And I'll turn back just a couple pages and read it again. He says, For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. You notice it's not our works. We don't overcome the world by our works. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. The person that's overcome the world is the person who has been saved. They've been born again. So today we're going to look at the first four churches. We're going to look at Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, and Thyatira. First of all, we see the letter to the callous church, that church at Ephesus. It's interesting how he begins his description. He says, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars. Who holds the seven stars? Jesus does, doesn't he? He holds the seven stars. Who's the star? Well, either the angel of the church or the passenger or messenger of the church, uh, one of those two, he holds, he's in control. By the way, when it comes to the pastor, you understand that God gives, just like he had seven different messengers, one for each of the churches, and a different message for each one of them uh, for those messengers to bring, that God gives to churches different men to lead them. Keep your hand here. Turn back to the book of Acts and look in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. When the apostle Paul invited the pastors that were in the churches that were at Ephesus, he invites them to talk to them as he's on his way back to uh, Jerusalem and they meet with him. He gives them an awful lot of, uh, well, quite a bit in the message there. But I want you to notice verse 28 of Acts chapter 20. He says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. Now look at this. Over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. That word pastor. Well, the pastor is an overseer or shepherd is an overseer of sheep. The word bishop literally means overseer. That's another name for pastor. And you notice he says, Therefore, uh, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which, who made them overseers? The Holy Ghost did that. Now, whether the, whether the person likes it or not, the biblical truth is this, that Mike Allison was made pastor or overseer of Madison Baptist Church by 
the Holy Ghost. There were certain things that he wanted in Madison Baptist Church, and out of all that he had to choose from, he chose me and put me as pastor for whatever length of time that it will be of Madison Baptist Church. Now, why, didn't, why don't they do the same things over at Fairview Baptist Church that we do at Madison Baptist Church? He had a different overseer for them. He knew what their needs were in that hour, and he brought Chesford Carr over there to be the overseer over there. And so some of the things are necessarily going to be different because God put a different man over there. Now, we've got the same book, and we're responsible to the same God and following the same book, but there is going to be methodology and, uh, and a number of other things different. The truth is, God gives each church either what they need or what they deserve. He does the same thing for a country with its leaders. By me, kings reign and princes decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. We have right now in leadership in Washington, D.C., exactly what we deserve. We've got it. We've continued to murder babies by the millions. We have a licentious lifestyle in this country, hedonist to the core. And so God has given us exactly what we deserve. Now, now, when it comes to the pastor of your church, whether you're a member here or someplace else, God gave you what you need or what you deserve, you can decide which. But either way, the Holy Ghost is the one who made him overseer. Hey, let me ask you a question. The first king of Israel, Saul, was he a good king? But he was still the anointed of the Lord. It was the Lord who made him the king. Do you understand that? Now, see, that money... That takes some meditation right there, thinking about the mind of God. And yes, yeah, some pastors are not all that they ought to be. Matter of fact, probably most pastors are not all that they ought to be. Doesn't change the fact as to who the one was that made them overseers. But I must say, it's an honor. I get stuck there all night. Uh, you notice, he says, who holds the seven stars. In other words, they belong to him. And Romans 14 says, who art thou that judgest another man's servant to his own master? He standeth or falleth. And then he says, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Now, according to chapter 1, the candlestick is the what? The church. Jesus is in the midst. He's paying attention. He is not up in heaven, totally disaffected or not affected by what's going on in his church, where two or three are gathered together in my name. There am I in the midst of them, and he is walking in the midst of his church. Now, after letting him know what he is, after all, he is the one who is the head of the church, all of that, he then says, I know your works. I know what your church is. And believe me, he knows exactly what Madison Baptist Church is. The truth is, there are some people that would think we have some weaknesses, and when they would name them, that in God's eyes, those aren't weaknesses, but strengths. And some people would think that some of the things that they think are strengths of Madison Baptist Church aren't strengths at all. His opinion is the one that counts, not mine, not yours. His opinion is the one that counts. We want to please him. That's why we need to be in the book. But he says, I know thy works, and he says a number of good things. If you look at these things, it's amazing. He says, I know thy works, that's good, thy labor, that's good. They were working, church, thy patience, how thou canst not bear them that are evil. In other words, they didn't just let the evildoers continue on in the church and peddling their evilness. For he says this, And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. Now that wasn't just a word to the church, that was the church. If they had a man come in that didn't preach the truth from the word of God, they found them as liars. You know, the Bible said of the people of Berea in uh, Acts 17, 11, that these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scripture daily to see if those things were so. You have a responsibility when you come to the house of God and hear a man get up who we trust is a man of God to follow along your Bible and make sure that what he's preaching is the Bible. And if it's not the Bible, then you ought to go to him and say, I don't get that out of there. Where do you see that out of there? Show it to me. Do you understand? Every father, every husband here, you have a responsibility to your family to make sure that what's being preached in the church that you're in is, thus saith the Lord, Amen. get the Bible out and follow along. Read it. Don't just come and sit, but get something. So now he's commending them for every one of these things. He says in verse 3, 
and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. I mean, they haven't just been a working church. They've continued on and they've done it in patience. They didn't give up on people when they didn't reach them the first time. They've continued after him. They've stood for truth, all of that. As a matter of fact, look at verse 6. He says, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also, what? Hate. He says, let me commend you for something else. You hate the deeds. Now, he's going to talk about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans in a few minutes in another church. Here he talks about their deeds. Because what you believe, what your doctrine is, will affect what your deeds are. He says, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. I hate them. I hate it too. I hate their deeds. Now, what are the Nicolaitans? There are many people who believe the Nicolaitans were folks who uh, taught that it's, it's only sin if it's sin to you. You know, they're the ones, probably the first ones who came up with, I'm not convicted about it yet, philosophy. Because I'm not convicted about it, therefore it must be okay. The Nicolaitans. So when they did something, if it felt right, boy, they'd have a heyday in this world of technology, wouldn't they? Uh, and by the way, they still do. They still do. We're talking about in the church. He said, I hate the deeds of the He said, congratulations. Now, with all that, what great things he says about this church. This is not a church that's gone liberal. This is not an emerging church. This is not even a new evangelical church. This church is fundamental to the core, and they stayed fundamental. But notice what he says. In verse 4, he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. He's got one thing to say against them. You've left your first love. Now, the scripture tells us the great commandment according to the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 39. He said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Yes, there are things that we're supposed to do and things we're not supposed to do. But first, above all, your heart needs to be in love with him. Some of you remember a time when, man, you couldn't wait to be in the house of God. You couldn't wait to read your Bible. You couldn't wait for your prayer time to come around. You couldn't wait to be of God's people. I mean, you taught a Sunday school class or you went soul winning. You said, hey, make me an usher. I don't care anything. I just want to serve him. And you did it out of a heart of love. And some of you who've done that, you still stand for truth. You've not gone liberal. You've still got standards in your life, all of that. But now you're just going through it for duty. He says, I've got something against you. You see, what we like to do when we start falling short in real spirituality, the spirituality of our heart, we excuse it by throwing up our works. Remember those lost people in John chapter 20, or, uh, Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus said, Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not what? Prophesied in thy name, cast out demons, done many wonderful works. He said, Then I'll profess to them, you depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. You see, they threw up their works as somehow a proof that things were right when they didn't even know him. But I got news for you. Good people will do the same thing. Well, how important is it? I mean, after all, as long as you believe right, and you stand for right, and you're separated, how important is it? Look at the next verse. He, next word, repent. What? Repent. Man, the same thing he'd say to a drunkard. You understand that? Same thing that he'd tell an adulterer. Same thing that he'd tell a lot. Repent. Repent. That remember from where, from where thou art fallen and return and do thy first works. You got to repent. Remember what it was like. Uh, first you remember, then you repent. Remember, repent, and then return to the first works. Return to that excitement. You say, well, preacher, how do I get that excitement back? What did you used to do when you were on fire for God? More than likely, you listened to some messages in your car. More than likely, what you listened to on the radio was different than what you listen to now. When you were on fire for God, there were things that you did because you were excited about God, and they kept the fire burning. You probably had a time, man, you set aside to pray, and you couldn't wait to pray. You made sure you were in the house of God and tired, all oh, big deal. He said, return and do thy first works. Now, I want you to notice the next two words. He says, or else. You might even underline those two words because that's key. This tells you 
how important your present love is to him or else look at it again I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place what's the candlestick the church he would rather there be no church here at all than a church full of fundamental people who aren't in love with him well that's tough right there the number one question for your heart tonight, how much is that love burning for Jesus Christ? How much in your service, your Sunday school class? I'm going to tell you what, if you're loving him with all your heart, soul, and mind, you don't start preparing for your Sunday school class Sunday morning when you get up. Or Saturday night before you go to bed. Man, you're in the word of God. You've been praying about that class, those kids that are coming. You've made some calls, or maybe adults at your team, you've made some calls. But God has been preparing, and you're on fire. You can't wait to get there and teach that class. He said, repent, or else I'll take your church out. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? He doesn't even say that about the other churches that are in here. He does about this one. This church was good in every outward aspect. But on the inside, the love was gone. They were simply doing it out of duty. Now, don't misunderstand I do believe it's right to do your duty. And i got to confess, there have been a lot of times when I've done things just because they were my duty to do them. But that can only be temporary. If that's how you're living, by duty, driving the bus by duty, going out visitation by duty, then you better repent and get right with God, or God could take your church away. I talked to a pastor just today. Good church, soul-winning church, reaching the lost, all of that. And he said, he said Brother Mike, Church is falling apart. It is falling apart. The attitudes. Some people have done wrong in the church and everybody's choosing side. He says, I'm preaching to them about forgiveness, about getting right. Nobody wants to listen. Everybody wants to hold on. And their church is coming to a screaming halt. I got news for you. A lot of good churches have fallen very, very quickly. And here's where it begins. When they lose their first love and they don't get it corrected. He says, you repent, I'll take it away from you. He said, man, I love my church. Okay, you love your church. How much do you love Jesus? If the love's not there like it was, repent so you don't lose your church. Repent. Now, go to the next one. That was the callous church. They become callous. Then notice the courageous church, verses 8 to 11. This is the church that was at Smyrna. And he says unto the angel of the church at Smyrna, right, these things saith he. Now, notice how he describes himself. First and last, which was dead and is alive. Now this is a church, he's going to tell us, that's been going through tribulation and poverty. Some have even been martyred. And he describes himself in this way, the first and the last which was dead and is alive. All right, go back to chapter 1. Look at chapter 1, verse 8. He describes himself there. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. You go down to verse 11. He says, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. You go down to verse 17. He says, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Now he's talking about a church, talking to a church, where the people are facing death. They're facing poverty, and it doesn't look like they're getting out of it this side of heaven. But he's letting them know, wait, it's not about what your bank account is. It's not about what your portfolio is for retirement. It is all really about him. He's the first. He's the last. He's the one who lived and died and rose from the dead. He conquered death. Everything here is only temporary. And it's getting better soon because the book ends saying three times he's coming quickly. So you don't have to fear. What if they're going to put you to death? What if Sharia law becomes law in the United States? What if it's the, no longer the Judeo-Christian law, but the Muslim law? And by the way, there are big cities where they're having a major impact. I'm talking not in France. I'm talking about the United States. Man, France is already gone. England's practically gone. Won't be long, will be gone, because we got too many Christians sitting in the pews doing nothing. 
Instead of standing for Christ and being open for Christ, persecution will be coming. But hey, he's letting us know he's the first and the last. He's conquered death. It's going to get better one day. You can count on it. Uh, in Romans 8, 18, he said, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And he goes on to let them know. He knows their opposition, and he knows the blasphemy of the opposition. For he says, uh, let's see, in verse 9, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. Now notice, they're in poverty. He says you're rich. The Laodicean church later on is rich, but he says they're poor and wretched and miserable and naked and blind. How rich you are, you're, you can't look at your bank account and find out how rich you are. You understand that? Because your riches are not determined by how many dollars you have or how much gold you have, how many stocks you have. It's determined by your walk with God. All right, he goes on. He says, I know the blasphemy, I know thy works, tribulation, poverty, and I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Sometimes you hear some of these people, and some of them are politicians, get up there and say some of the most ungodly things about the Christian God and the Bible and Christians. You say, how are they getting away with that today? Doesn't anybody care? Well, God does, and he's keeping a record, and they will answer to him. God says, listen, you may not see it, but I'm paying attention. I know all about it. I not only know your works, I know their works. And I know their words. You can count on God. So notice what he tells them. In verse 10, he says, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. See, God didn't say he was going to get them out of suffering. He said, don't fear it. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57. That's all right. God will give you victory in all this. You know, it says uh, on all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. So fear not that. I've got a reward for you. And he goes on to say, uh, let's see in this verse, be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. So he says, don't fear all your suffering, all your poverty. It's only temporary. And I've got a reward for you when you're done. So Smyrna is the courageous church. The callous church was Ephesus. And then you've got the careless church. That's the church at Pergamos. Notice beginning in verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. Now what is that? What's the sharp sword with two edges? Yeah, he's going to pass some pretty tough judgment on him here in just a moment. And he's letting him know, Hey, I'm the one with the sharp sword with two edges. You don't have a sharp sword with two edges. It's his. That's his. You may have, now I know some people have some very, man, they got a sword for a tongue that cuts people up. But it's not this sword. This sword is true. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, Hebrews 4.12. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I mean, this is a cutting word, and it cuts deep. And notice what he goes on to say in verse 13. He says, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is. One of the things he said, I know your works, and you're in a tough place. You see, even when the sower went out to sow in that parable that Jesus told, same sower, same seed, he threw, so he threw the seed out on all different kinds of soil. The truth is, some churches are in a place that is just ripe for bearing much fruit. And some churches that are in a place that are very, very hard and very, very difficult to bear fruit. God knows. You know, a lot of times, uh, and there are pastors out there, they want every missionary they support to send them a soul-winning report. And if they don't see a bunch of people saved, they drop them. They're absolutely taking no account for what soil they are spreading their seed on. Sometimes God calls people, and by the way, those hard places, God still wants seed dropped there. Isn't that right? But now, he says, I understand, I understand your work in a very difficult place. You can't get more difficult than being in the place where Satan's seed is at. I mean, you think it's tough in Alabama, man. 
Go where Satan's seat is at. See what kind of opposition you're going to get. So then he says to them, And thou holdest fast my name. So here they are in a difficult place. Witches, blasphemers, the occultists, all of that. And hast not denied my faith, even in those days where Antipas was my faithful martyr and was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Now, I'm looking at this church, and just by what I've read so far, it almost sounds to me like the church of Smyrna all over again. They've suffered, they've seen death among their own members for standing for Jesus. They have stood fast in a very difficult place. But then the next verse says, but I have a few things against thee. Well, what could he have against a church like this where some of their people have even suffered death? I think it's going to be interesting to note that your location is not an excuse to allow wrong things into the church. Well, you know the people. Who does that sound like? Well, you know the people. Doesn't that sound like Aaron back when he made the golden calf and Moses come down and saying, but, but the people, they're bent on mischief. And when Saul disobeyed God by not killing all that the Amalekites had, and Samuel comes to confront him, he said, but the people. No, no, there's no excuse for disobeying God. You say, but preacher, look at our culture. Yeah, I know, it's wicked. And we would think Satan's seat is right here in the United States. But that's not an excuse for compromising the word of God. So he goes on. He says, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. He, where? In the church, there were people who held the doctrine of Balaam, and he's finding fault with the church for it. Now, what was the doctrine of Balaam? For that, you go back to the book of Numbers. In the book of Numbers, you remember, the king of Moab wanted to get the prophet Balaam to come and to curse the people of God. He was going to make Balaam rich, stand him on a mountain, and have him just curse the people of God because Balak, the king of Moab, felt that Balaam had certain powers. Well, when Balaam gets there and he looks out over the people, he says, I can't curse who God has blessed. Three times he gives him the chance, but he can't do it. And he says, God won't let me do it. It's good so far. But then he says, hey, but if you want God to curse him, here's what you do. Send your heathen daughters down there to marry their sons. And send your heathen sons down there to mix with their daughters. And then God will have to curse them. You know there are a lot of people today that do not think that it's a major idea who your child marries. The spirituality of the child, a uh, person that they're going to marry. Sometimes even the Christianity of the child. It always amazes me when somebody says, yeah, I'm going to be getting married. And I say, well, is he a Christian? And they say, well, he says he is. Man, if that's all they can say, then that's automatically the wrong person. What do you mean he says he is? Better be something better than just the fact that he says he is. People say all kinds of things. The devil says all kinds of things, and he's a liar. They better be careful about the doctrine of Balaam. And then he describes it, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel and to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So the doctrine of Balaam then... Denies separation, allows things that God has condemned, and then on top of that, commits immorality. Do you know what that reads like? 1 Corinthians. Eating meat offered sacrifice to idols was condemned in Acts chapter 15 at the Jerusalem Council in 50 AD. It's condemned in 1 Corinthians chapters 8 through 10. Three chapters that tell us why it's wrong. It's condemned there. And here we find that it's still condemned, even one of the last books of the Bible, and Jesus speaks to a church about it. Now you say, preacher, we don't have that problem. You go and live in an area of some of our cities in the United States, go into their grocery stores where they are selling meat to Muslims, and what you will find out is the meat that they are packaging has been dedicated to their gods. Do you understand that? You see, people in other countries... They know about this stuff. Christians in other countries have had to face this, where Buddhists are in power or Hindus in power, whatever. Where Muslims are in power, they actually dedicate this meat, sacrifice to their gods for their people to eat. And Christians are not to eat it. Even says so on their packaging that they do it. 
Now, you may not be facing it yet at Walmart, but you will be before long. So are you going to be a Christian, stand on the Word of God, or are you going to follow the doctrine of Balaam and say, well, that's not important? That's the doctrine of Balaam. He says, you've got people in the church following the doctrine of Balaam. He says, I hate the doctrine of Balaam, or the doctrine of, of Balaam, yes. And then he says, so house also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Wow, you believe God hates certain types of doctrine? Yes, he does. Again, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans that, you know, if it's wrong to you, it's wrong, but it, it's, not, it's okay for me. No, no, God's word is final, not your feelings. You realize that Israel was given a sacrifice for the sin of ignorance? And that doesn't mean being, duh, stupid. It means... You sin, and you don't even know it's a sin. If you sin, it's a sin, whether you know it's a sin or not. You're ignorant of God's word, and you do something God says don't do, that's a sin of ignorance. But I dare say that's not the problem with most of our people who sin. What they do, they know what God's word says, but they've taken the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and said, but I don't see what's wrong with it, therefore it's okay. You see, these two doctrines are still taught in Bible-believing churches today by people and held to by members. He says, hey, church, uh, I see, I know what you've gone through. I know what you've been through, but I got news for you. You've got some things in there I hate. You've got some people there who hold to the doctrine of Balaam and to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Verse 16, he says, repent or else. And then he says, if you don't repent, I'm going to come and fight against those in the church that hold those doctrines. Whoa. I remember hearing S.M. Lockridge preach a message on, on Psalm 2 where God says that he would vex them with a great vexation, speaking of the world. And I'm, I'll never forget him talking about when you've been vexed by the head vexer, you don't have much hope. When God comes to fight against you, where are you going to turn when God fights against you? Who are you going to turn to when God fights against you? He's not writing to the world. He's writing to the church. That's who he's writing to. All right, so it goes on. Then he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear. So he gives that warning again. But he's, some of the theological discussions in some of these internet blogs allowed by God's people, hated by God. I mean, there's some of these places Christians just have no place being. I don't care if it's called a Christian blog. When they're pushing the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, Buddy, you better get off it, and I mean now. I don't want to be standing beside someone when God throws a lightning bolt to take them out. I mean, he said, well, you might not get hurt. I know, but I get their blood all over me, and I don't want that. How do you like to be standing next to somebody when they explode? That's gross, isn't it? Well, some of you are looking like you're not getting it. I just want to make sure you're still awake. Let's go to the last one here. So... <laughs> You had the first church, church at Ephesus was a callous church. The church of Smyrna was a courageous church. And then you've got the careless church of Pergamos. But then you got the confused church, the church of Thyatira. In verse 18, he says, And unto the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God. Ooh, all right. Uh, we were just talking about the head vexer here. You're not getting any higher than this. These things saith the Son of God. And notice how he describes himself who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Both of those are descriptions of judgment. Judgment. Remember the judgment seat of Christ, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 13 through 15. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it and it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. He is reminding, and this doesn't put the fear of God in these people then, buddy, they have missed the first step of wisdom. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom and so on. So now we move on here in this church. He says, I know thy works. Now look what he says about this church with their works. They had love. Oh, that was the problem with the church at Ephesus. They didn't have love. They must be okay. We can expect everything to be fine now. They got love. This is a good church. Uh, by the way, you can have love, but if your love is not tempered by the word of God, it's not going to be acceptable to the Lord. 
there are going to be problems. I got news for you. You go to a lot of merging churches and the people that go there feel they're loved. You can go to a lot of cults, like for instance, the Way International, the Children of God, places like that. You know how those cults that end up getting people wrapped up in a mind control that it's almost impossible to get them out of? Do you know how they get people in deep? Love. They love them. They're all the time telling them they love them, pouring themselves out for them. Love. But just because they have love doesn't mean they're right. This church, of course, they've got love. It's good they've got love. We are to have love. Isn't that right? All right, so we go on. He says, uh, let me see. Let me get back to my passage here. Um, he says, love, service, faith. Faith is good. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. He said, what you're doing now is more than what you used to do. Yippee! Because most churches, after a little while, go down as to what they used to do. Might be giving up their bus routes, giving up their Sunday school class, give up their Sunday school completely. Don't, re, don't uh, bug people about going out soul winning. This church is doing more than they ever did. I mean, this is the most they've ever done. These are people that would get a write-up in the National Fundamental Independent Baptist magazine right here. They're doing a lot. Matter of fact, we'd think about taking a camera crew in there to find out how they're doing it. Because these people are busy. And Jesus commends them for it. But then he says, he says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Good. Night sounds like the doctrine of Balaam all over again. You, when he says sufferest, that word means you allow. You allow it to take place. What? You've got a woman in your church. She calls herself. Notice, he doesn't call her a prophetess. She calls herself a prophetess. Name's Jezebel. Does that ring any bells? Does that Jezebel ring any bells? Oh, yeah, go back to Ahab and Jezebel. Now, was she just a picture of that Jezebel, or is Jezebel her name? I think both. Jezebel was her name. I don't think that these people, when they read the letter, sat around, oh, who's he talking about? Now, the truth is, <laughs> if I was talking about Jezebel at Madison Baptist Church, everybody here sitting trying to figure out who I was talking about, and you all wouldn't come up with the same name. I'm not saying there is one. I'm just saying you wouldn't come up with the same name. But these people, when they read this, they knew who he was talking about. Now, this woman who is allowed in this church to do these things, to teach these things that aren't right, obviously, the way it's described, same way the Dr. Balaam was described, she's allowed to teach this. She wasn't just in the church. She was teaching. She was telling others. They'd call her on the phone, and this is the type of thing she spouted out. <laughs> to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now that sounds like 1 Corinthians chapter 5, as well as 1 Corinthians chapters 8 through 10. Also sounds like 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 through chapter 7. You remember that's where it talks about fleeing fornication. And about every sin that a man does is without the body, but he that commits fornication sins against his own body. That's when he says, What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own, for you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Now concerning the things whereof, <laughs> well, concerning the things whereof you wrote me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication. Let every man have his own wife. Now, you know, especially when I hear coming from young people, whether it be singles, or high schoolers, or even if I hear from adults, when they say, but preacher, I don't see what's wrong with us kissing before we get married. Sounds to me like they've been listening to Jezebel to me. Come on now. That's what Jezebel taught. You see, God put a stop. Not, he's not just against fornication. He's against what leads up to it. He tells you not to do certain things so you never get to that point. You understand? I see this. This is serious to God. He said, I have somewhat against thee. You're allowing this woman to teach this stuff. 
All right? Now notice what he's going to do. He says, I gave her space to repent of her fornication. I gave her an opportunity to repent. Uh, and she repented not. Behold, I'll cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. I'll kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts, and I'll give unto every one of you according to your works. Ooh. Boy, if people following this one better be careful. But then he says, But unto you I say, and unto the rest of Thy in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will have put upon you none other burden. But, but what? He says, But that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. He said, Let, You say, Well, preacher, I, I wouldn't follow a doctrine like that. Good. You hold fast with what you got. Don't you change. Hey, why did Paul, when Paul said, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine? Why? Because the time will come when they no longer will endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, so they heap on themselves teachers having itching ears. He says, you hold fast. Don't you back up? Now's not the time to be compromising. You hold fast. Because the problem is once you start compromising, once you leave the line that is drawn by the word of God, then you have got no authoritative place to draw a line. So you just stay right there. And yeah, Jezebel and the people of the doctrine of Balaam and the people of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, uh, yeah, they're going to say, what's wrong with you? And they're going to call you all kinds of names and they're going to be sure to exclude you from their circles. But you hold fast till he comes. You see, this church had become a confused church because they allowed the wrong things to be taught. You remember in 2 John, when John warned the people he was writing to, if any man come unto you and have not the doctrine of Christ, neither receive him into your house, neither bid him Godspeed, for in bidding him Godspeed, you become a partaker in his evil deeds. When you give ear to that which denies the clear truth in the word of God, then you become a partaker with them. Now, when it comes to the doctrine of Christ, of course, that's why you can't allow Jehovah's Witness. I don't care if you do want to sit there and argue with them about the Bible. You can't let them into your house. God said don't do it. They don't have the doctrine of Christ. They worship a different Jesus. Those Mormon missionaries, they may look cute, their hair's cut right, they look nice, all that, got that little elder sign on them, and you feel sorry for them in the heat of the summertime, riding that bicycle in Alabama up and down the hills, but God says you can't let them into your house. They have a different doctrine of Christ, and you're not to bid them good day. I, I preach, I don't know I can do it. Jesus said to do it. It's a matter of truth's sake. That, that ought to be enough for you. So then he says, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. This is the only one of the mentions to the overcomers that is not for all overcomers. It's only for the overcomers that keep his works unto the end. In other words, that don't fall by the wayside, that don't, that, that, that don't stop enduring. He says, there's something with you about reigning with Christ. So you've got the callous church. Now, how's your heart? Are you callous? Are you serving the Lord, but the love isn't there, that fire's not there? Man, then remember from whence thou art fallen, repent and do thy first works. Are, are you courageous? Man, you're standing and you're suffering for it. You might lose a job for standing for the things of God. You may be one of those people that they've sent you to sensitivity training three times. And you still believe sodomy is sin. See, you're, you're not sensitive. Well, if you lose your job for it, that's fine. Courageous church. It's all coming to an end one day. Don't be a careless church, though, by beginning to allow doctrines that are wrong. By the way, here's one of my problems with some of these, some of these internet blog, Christian internet, you know, people write in and they blog all the time. They argue about things like Calvinism and non-Calvinism. Well, I'm not putting Calvinism on the same level with truth. I'm not going to debate it. I'll expose it for the error that it is, but I'm not putting it on the same platform like his truth is as good as my truth when his truth is a lie. So, you're just opening up the door to lose, lose the whole show. 
once you elevate them to that position. Any morning, I'm going to have a Church of Christ preacher in here to argue his false gospel. You've got to hear, believe, receive, repent, and be baptized. No longer the end. That's the gospel. When it's not the gospel, the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're not putting those two gospels on the same platform because only one of them is the true gospel. We'll expose the false gospel. That's what we'll do. We're not going to be careless about it, and we sure don't want to become confused to where we no longer can even figure out the main things. And this is one of the things that has probably bothered me most about independent fundamental Baptists in the last few years. Whereas there have always been some disagreements between churches about things, even among, yes, independent Baptists. Every independent Baptist church I knew knew how to be saved. But you look at a lot of their web pages, they can't decide on what saves a man now. And brother, when our folks can't decide somewhere, they got confused. How on earth did they get confused? Because the Bible's not changed in all these years. They start listening. Oh, get something. Start listening to some other things. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you, dear God, for the things you've taught us. And we look forward to next week looking at the last three churches in chapter 3. But in all of these churches, Lord, there are some things that we need to get a hold of, either because we need them right now or we'll need them in the future. So please, Father, help us to stand upon the truths of the Word of God. Lord, I think first of that first church, Ephesus. All their works were everything that we would want a church to be, you would think. But you were ready to take them away because their love was gone. Lord, as we have our invitation tonight, may we allow the Spirit of God to search out our heart. And wherever we fall in in any of these churches, but especially in this matter of a calloused heart, if we recognize that in ourselves, Father, may we ask your forgiveness. God, may we set our affections on things above, get our hearts back like they once were to return. And Lord, we'll thank you for what you do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.